Hello and welcome to Click Online. I'm Stephen Cole and this is the show that takes a caring, sharing approach. And especially this week as we investigate whether or not the file sharing frenzy of recent years is set to continue. Coming up. The global entertainment industry has been desperate to stem the trade in illegal music and movie swapping. But how much success are they having? Also in the programme, to show we really do care. Rob Freeman gets to grips with your PC gripes. We show you how to get more out of your GPS receiver and to round things off, our regular rundown of the web's best. Barely a day goes by without some mention of what has got to be one of the biggest issues of the day. File sharing has become so pervasive, so commonplace, that many users no longer stop to even question its rights and wrongs. Well, the morals and the legality of file sharing has always been loudest in the pleas of entertainment lawyers and marketers who complain it deprives them of their just profits. And now they're embarking on parallel attempts to get us buying into their own offerings. Chris Long has been surveying the latest moves. Chris. This is the Apple iPod. It's one of the gadget world's must-have toys. As well as that, there are many parts of the world where it brings the possibility of the police kicking your door down and arresting you. This roller coaster device and its millions of lookalikes is built on one single technology, file sharing. Oh sure, you had a shed load of other technologies playing a role, but the success of the iPod and its ilk is down to the ability to share, via the web, borrowed music. It started with the PC, and sort of spread out from there. File sharing, in one way or another, has been going on for 10, 20 years or so. For the first time, people hooked up modems to telephone lines and their personal computers and found they could share files. The big break in file sharing happened when uh, Napster kicked off um, about three or four years ago, when uh, they invented a way to advertise what files you had and they met the connection so you could pick and choose from among thousands or millions of files. Ah, uh, Napster a name that brings a warm glow to copyright lawyers all over America. It promised free software for all, delivered, and was promptly closed down, only to be sold and opened up again, but this time as a wholly legal music downloading site. I was a freshman at Northeastern University, which is in Boston, studying computer science, and I looked at Napster as a way to uh, try and learn more about computer science, more about programming, kind of explore some things that were interesting to me. The, the reason it was interesting is not because it was different or just because it was digital, because it was better. It was instant gratification, better supply of music. About 70% of the people that go into a music store can't find what they're looking for. But this music store was free. Roll up, roll up, get your free music here. And that's when the lawyers joined in. There were many negotiations, and for various reasons and various personalities involved, they couldn't get people to agree. And as a result, massive lawsuits, um, massive legal expenses, and I don't think anybody expected that it would all be shut down. Killing off Napster wasn't the end. With all that software, someone had to help distribute it. Enter Kazar. Kazar don't run their own servers. Uh, Napster did to some extent, but then even while well, Napster was still going, people wrote their own Napster server software and took that load off Napster. So again, when Napster closed down, now the skeleton was still in place. Because uh, I was sort of taking that to one level more, where it's expected that everyone shares in the business of, of managing the network. With all this downloading and a clampdown worldwide on copying, first America and now Europe have resorted to using the law to attack transgressors. Kazar has currently fended off several court cases and in America they've gone after the individual downloaders. In America we all know from press reports that the RIAA has taken fairly strong action against uh, what we call serial uploaders. Now the people they were targeting were people who were uploading music and therefore making it available to everyone else on a very large scale. They did not set out to target 12-year-old girls. It is very regrettable, and I think they regretted, that uh, that was the, the outcome of their action. And now Europe has introduced a new law. The recent European Enforcement Directive um, is an important move forward for the enforcement of rights 
because whilst in a number of European countries it may not make a big difference to their existing laws, it does ensure that all member states of the European Union, and that includes in particular the 10 member states that are joining us on the 1st of May, all have, um, that have to conform to the same standards in terms of enforcing rights. And of course, there's another take on it. It's still not clear exactly what it can do because there's a rather weak amendment that says, unless you're actually benefiting commercially from this, you're, we're not going to touch you. But it's not clear what commercially means. It's quite possible that you know, you're stealing something, you're benefiting, therefore they can touch you. And this leads to the idea of people breaking down your door, nicking your computers, freezing your bank accounts, for sharing one file. And as if that wasn't enough, there's the security issue. Although that isn't so much to do with the file sharing as the files you share. If you open up your port on your firewall to enable peer-to-peer -peer software to work as it normally does, that doesn't enable someone else to send a virus to your hardware. It's when you initiate a download from someone else's computer that you actually introduce a risk of um, getting a virus, etc. Interestingly, even the new reformed completely legal Napster thinks file sharing won't go away. Will there be people out there that will be in the, in the gray areas and offering that? Yes. But will it be the place that the masses reside? No. In the week that Apple's music download site, iTunes, is boasting about hitting 50 million downloads, it's worth noting they were actually aiming for 100 million this time last year. Napster still waiting to launch outside the UK. Not only doesn't have any Led Zeppelin albums, there aren't any Beatles songs on it either. So, given that you can still download thousands and thousands of dollars worth of stolen software, it's still fair to say the story isn't over yet. Thanks very much, Chris. And you can find more resources about file sharing on our website. And the address is coming up later in the show. Time now, though, to check out some of the technology stories behind the headlines this week. Intel is rumoured to be changing the way it markets its chips. From this summer, it will apparently be ditching the pure speed benchmark in favour of model numbers, which would emphasise broader overall performance. Sounds very similar to the move made by rivals AMD a couple of years back. Chinese broadband take-up is booming. Last year, China became a world leader in DSL subscribers. There are now more than 19 million, a five-fold increase over the previous year. The reason? Apparently online gaming. And finally, US cable company Comcast is threatening to disconnect customers whose infected PCs are being used to relay spam messages. Up to a third of all spam is thought to be emitted from so-called zombie PCs, which have been hijacked with Trojan horses and worms. The practice can wreak havoc with the operations of ISPs. Comcast has sent warning letters to customers telling them to disinfect their computers or face the chop. Now you wouldn't believe just how many of your emails every week are simply a cry out for help. Not suggestions on what you'd like to see in a show, not incisive opinions on tech issues, which we love by the way, but pure and simple questions about computers and technology. So here to guide you through that veritable maze of computing and all its conundrums, here's Rob Freeman. Thanks, Stephen. Hello. How many of you have trouble remembering your password? Do you just make it something really simple so you don't forget it? A common password to use is simply the word password. But maybe you use numbers instead, in which case your password is probably your birth date, or maybe just one, two, three. Perhaps you want to be extra secure, so you make it a bit longer. One, two, three, four, five, six. One of the most common passwords is Manchester United. Now look at this stern expression. You know what's coming next, don't you? That's right. You shouldn't use any of those as passwords. They're all too easily guessed by someone else. And if someone else guesses them, then your private information can be stolen. Is it necessary, asks Harris Sharma in India, to have different usernames and passwords for different sites? Yes, absolutely. And you would be amazed the number of people who don't. Mainly because the more unique passwords you have, the more you have to remember. But if you have the same password for everywhere and someone finds out what it is, then all your information's at risk. But here's something you may want to try to make it easy to remember and still have a different password for every site. Think of a word. I'm going to use the word koala as the example here. Now this is your common word and you make passwords up by adding additional letters to the beginning and the end of your common word. 
and the other letters are associated with the website that you're visiting. So if I'm at the Click Online website, for example, that might be Click Koala Online, or maybe even BBC Koala Click. You see? Now, you might even write portions of this down, but leave out your common word. So in this case, you would just have BBC Click. And all you have to remember is Koala. But don't tell anyone how you construct your passwords, and certainly don't let anyone know what your common word is. Paul Luff in Germany next. Why, when all other countries make do with a two-letter ending, Germany is .de, for example, the UK domains need to end .co.uk? Are we something special? Well, Paul, the UK's country domain name is just .uk. The .co indicates a commercial website, like the American .com. In fact, lots of countries make this distinction. It's called a second-level domain. Australia, New Zealand, India, Mexico, South Korea, there are a few more. They all group addresses according to whether they're companies or schools or individuals or non-profit organizations. It means they can fit more names under their country domain space. For example, geography.co.uk might be the name of a commercial map company, whilst geography.org.uk takes you to the Geographical Association. Many other countries choose not to categorise like this, and that's their choice, although I've always thought it's odd that Canada is one of the ones that doesn't. Each country has its own body to control names. In Britain, that's Nominet, and their address here is nic.uk. The United States has traditionally not used geographical suffix on its names, and that's historical. In the same way, Britain is the only country that doesn't put its name on stamps because it invented the postal system, America doesn't put its name on internet addresses because that's the system they invented. Now, that may change gradually as names run out, and there is already a .us domain which is available to use. A couple of internet sites coming up if you want to know more. The first is ICANN at ICANN.org slash general. ICANN coordinates between all the countries who share the internet to assign names and prevent clashes. Secondly, there's domains.dan.info, one of the best sites I've seen on the internet for explaining how all these names are organised, with some more information on the .us names, how they work and how to get one. They're usually cheaper than the .coms, incidentally. There are some hints on how to get the best name for you, and my favourite section is a hall of shame for ways in which the naming system has been misused. That section is particularly geeky, but that's why I like it. More from me next time. Keep clicking. Stephen. Thanks, Rob. Coming up, a matter of degrees. The GPS project taking snapshots of our world. And, as always, our weekly wander through the best of the web. So don't go away. Now, if you thought GPS was just for finding out where you are, Think again. Enthusiasts around the world have been using the technology to draw a very different picture than the one you're used to on your in-car system. Our map man, Spencer Kelly, has been hot on the trail. Wherever you go in the world, from the biggest city to the highest mountain, your position can be described by just two coordinates. The number of degrees west or east, your longitude, and the number of degrees north or south, your latitude. The world is crisscrossed by these lines of longitude and latitude, and wherever two lines cross, you get something called a degree confluence point. The coordinates there are simply whole numbers of degrees. From this idea comes the degree confluence project. Its aim, to visit every confluence point on every continent around the globe and take a picture. Since 1996, confluencers have sampled the world at nearly 3,000 confluence points in 140 countries. As a result, the project is gradually building up a photographic map of the world. Each one of these tiny photographs is a successful confluence visit. And new ones are being added every day. Here it is, 40 degrees north, 105 west, Colorado, USA. Well, it was a dry day, so I decided to give it a shot myself. I'm going in search of the nearest confluence point to my house, 51 degrees north and 1 degree west. And to help me find it, I've met up with master confluencer Gordon Spence, who himself has visited every confluence point in his native England. So, Gordon, why do you do this? Um, it's one of the few things left in the world where you can actually be an explorer. And actually, I'm going to do something that nobody's ever done before. 
and uh, it kind of appeals to the sense of adventure in me, basically. And uh, because it's there, what more reason do you need? Wherever you are, there's a confluence point within 49 miles of you, so you don't have to pack a passport to visit one. All you need is a GPS unit and a camera to prove you've been there. Oh, and the landowner's permission to pay a visit, of course. Are there any golden confluence points where everyone wants to get to? Uh, there is one in North America, it's in the water catchment area and it's strictly off limits. Even though they know that we're a, a scientific research project that will not allow anybody in any circumstances. Has anything unusual happened to you while you've been confluencing? Uh, I was out in western Texas about a year or so ago and I spotted by a local taking photographs who so with a digital unit in my hand and uh, I was very politely inquired, was I a spy or not? <laughs> what did you say? Uh, no. <laughs> the Confluence Project is an example of the growing popularity of GPS-related hobbies. Uh, well, there's a variety of things. There's the Confluence Project, as you've mentioned. There's geocaching. It's um, hunting for a little lunchbox in out in the woods somewhere. Um, there's uh, trig point searching as well for the old Ordnance Survey pillars. GPS units aren't just a specialist at all. Uh, anyone can use them. Families use them for going out walking and so on. Well, after a brisk walk, our GPS units told us we were getting close to our target. But getting close is one thing. Actually finding the point with the exact coordinates can be more tricky. GPS is only accurate to a few meters, and that means quite a bit of trial and error, and something that's called the confluence dance. But finally, if you're lucky and the wind's blowing in the right direction, you'll hit the spot and get your photo. Well, I've made it 51 degrees north and 1 degree west, exactly. And I get the feeling I'm not alone. Of the 64,000 confluence points on the planet, 16,000 are on or near land, although most are as yet unrecorded. As a regular sampling of the world, confluence points completely miss large cities like London or New York illustrating just how little of the world is actually built on. Most points are simply out in the open. And as the incomplete map demonstrates, with 13,000 land points still to be visited, there's plenty of opportunity to get out there and be a pioneer. Two things strike me about the Degree Confluence Project. Firstly, it encourages people to learn about GPS and then get out and use it to explore. And secondly, for people who can't travel, well, they get to see the world through photographs, not just through some map, but through photographs of what's actually there. And as geography lessons go, well, I've had worse. And that was Spencer Kelly on the Degree Confluence Project. Now onto someone who also has a fair degree of latitude, boom, boom. Over to Kate Russell, who's been trawling the web to snap up some of her own rich pickings to share with us. Kate. Well, I thought I'd kick off this week with something just a little bit different. It came to my attention when Neil from Liverpool sent in his suggestion for a website built using a technology known as WikiWiki. Wiki. Whoever said that the computer world has boring names? Well, now, the concept has been around on the internet since at least 1995. It's basically a web page architecture that allows anyone to edit any part of any page and it can be edited without restrictions and completely anonymously. It's a strange concept to get your head around, so probably the best thing to do is make your way to the WikiWiki Wiki sandbox and just have a play around for yourself. And you can see from this page that people have just entered random thoughts and ideas to see if it works. Try it for yourself. Scroll down to the bottom of the page, click edit text and then add your own words or delete or change something already written there if you like. Obviously, as with all public access areas of the internet, it is open to abuse. But don't forget, if you see anything like that, you can rectify it. Just click edit at the bottom of the page and put the author right. Well, I guess you'll just have to make your own mind up on that one. Many of the WikiWiki Wiki pages that are on the web just look messy and confusing to the untrained eye. But one excellent example of a really well-maintained WikiWiki Wiki website is this, Wikipedia. Wikipedia is a free encyclopedia created entirely by its users. It's been going since January 2001 and now has over 200,000 pages of content. 
With such a vast collection of facts to its name, this site really does need moderation and has administrators in place to protect certain key pages from unauthorised editing. The front page displays the latest news stories and a featured article. But if you're looking for facts, type your query in the search box and click Go. Words with additional data behind them appear as underlined links, allowing you to follow a seemingly endless chain of information. And don't forget, if at any time you feel you can add something worthwhile to the Wikipedia, just click the Edit This Page link in the left-hand column and make your contribution. Well, this next site sent in to us at clickonline at bbc.co.uk was put together by an Australian school teacher called Malcolm Farnsworth and is another fine example of a hugely enlightening personal website. Watergate.info, as the name would suggest, is all about the complex web of political scandals surrounding the Nixon administration between 1972 and 1974. It's a must-read for anyone who wants to know more about American politics from that era, and I'm sure that students of politics will find the plain, no-nonsense approach to the facts a really useful tool for their studies. Even if you're not studying the subject, it makes a fascinating read. And as a politics teacher, Malcolm's straightforward presentation of the information that's available today is really easy to digest. The site covers everything, from a general overview and contrasting analysis summaries to a transcript of the famous smoking gun tapes, the recorded conversation in the Oval Office between President Nixon and his chief of staff. Well, I hope you've enjoyed our trip through the weird and wonderful world of the web. There will be links to all of the pages covered today on our website, so it couldn't be easier to enjoy them for yourself. Our address will be coming up in just a moment. Stephen. Well, as you probably guessed, Kate's trawl through the web is where we have to leave it for this week. Remember, our website is at hand for everything featured in the show and a lot more besides. You can find our link at the BBC News Technology website at bbc.co.uk slash news slash technology. But don't remain passive. Email us too. You can do it from the site where there are also details how to send in video or audio clips of your comments and questions. And you can get a few seconds of televisual glory. If that's all too complicated, then drop us a line at clickonline at bbc.co.uk. But for now, from me, Stephen Cole, and all the team, until the next time we click online, it's goodbye.